public service. And after graduating from the University of Missouri, Senator Duquesne started his career in public service by going to Honduras and hitting up a, get this, a technical school founded by Jesuit missionaries. And he trained teenagers to become carpenters and welders so that they could have a career and lift up not only their own lives, but the lives of their family and their communities. And it was there that his core values were cemented, his core values of faith, family, and work that is so much of his life and his, and I'm going to call it ministry today. Senator Kane attended Harvard Law School, and there he met his wife, Ann Holton, Virginia Ann Holton, the daughter of former Governor Limwood Holton, fell in love, got married, got married in the church that they attend now in Richmond, and moved back to Richmond. And he practiced law in Richmond for 17 years. And his practice was focused on representing those that are disadvantaged, that were discriminated in housing because of either their race, their disability, or their family status. And in 1998, he was part of the group that won a major civil rights case that was a case about an insurance company discriminating against a minority neighborhood. And then he did something that every member of the state legislature in Congress needs to do, and that's run for city council. <laughs> that ought to be a requirement. And I'm going to announce today I'm going to work to make that a constitutional amendment. <laughs> And he was elected to the Richmond City Council in 1994, and then mayor uh, four years later. And let me tell you what he did. Richmond had the reputation of having the highest homicide rate, one of the highest in, in the nation. And he worked hard with law enforcement agencies and communities throughout the Richmond, and it resulted in a reduction in the violent crime rate. And then, in 19, or not 19, in 2002, he was elected Lieutenant Governor, and then he was a, of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and then he was inaugurated in 2006 as Virginia's 70th, 7th Governor. And as Governor, he focused on education and health care. But it was reported that Governor Kane then visited a school in every county and every city in the Commonwealth. And think about that. There are over 100 counties and over 30 cities. That's a lot of work. But his work result resulted in the national publications claiming that Portsmouth was the best place the very best place in the nation to raise a child and to do business. I think that's awesome. And if you remember, about 2000, 2008, there came the great, great recession. And under Governor Kane's leadership, he helped Virginia navigate that uh, through that successfully. Senator Kane was elected to the United States Senate in 2012 and then re-elected again in 2018. And he serves on the Senate Armed Forces Committee, which is good for the Commonwealth and good for Hampton Roads. And he works to ensure that our military has the resources to get the job done. But one of the things that undergirds what he does as a senator is his work to boost 
job opportunities, to boost access to programs like this. And he co-chairs the Bipartisan Career and Technical Education Caucus, which is focused on programs like this, job training, to make sure, to make sure that we have a workforce that has the knowledge and the skills to do this most important work of our modern economy. And it gives me goosebumps to introduce our friend and our senator, Senator Tim Kaine. Hey. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks everybody. Good morning. Well, after an intro like that, I better be good. <laughs> I'm going to say to, uh, to the mayor how much I always enjoy being with you guys in Portsmouth. I see council members and school board members and economic development officials and state legislators, and Portsmouth is a great city. It's got a lot of similarities to Richmond where I live. Portsmouth and Richmond have so many similarities, and I always feel at home when I'm here. So thank you for doing this today. Uh, I want to thank my friend Bobby Scott. You do not know how lucky you are to have Bobby as your congressman, and especially come January 3, the nation's going to be lucky because having Congressman Scott, after his long career in both the state legislature and Congress, being chairman of what I think could be the most important committee in the House. I mean, what makes us economically competitive? At the top is the educated workforce. That, that's more important than tax policy. That's more important than everything. Other things are really important, but the workforce you have is the single most important thing to your competitiveness as a community, state, country. And to have the chair of that committee as your representative is going to create so many opportunities for us. And so I'm thrilled to be a partner with Congressman Scott as we work on these issues together. I want to thank everybody for the community college system to be here at TCC. Um, let me do this. If you are either a TCC student, alum, or faculty member or employee, just all of you guys stand up so we can give you a big round of applause. Please stand. Yeah. It, was, uh, it, was, it was good to come in and take a little tour and visit with some of the students, some of the grads, some of the professors. And um, my heart is very full. I could, e I could either give you the four-hour speech or the four-minute speech. I'll try to do the four-minute version. Yeah. Yeah. Lionel's applauding at that. The, the reason it's full is that this kind of event focusing upon uh, career and technical training is like the thing I'm probably just about most passionate about of anything. I grew up, my dad was a welder, ran an ironworking welding shop, uh, iron worker organized union shop in the stockyards of Kansas City, small, in a, in a good year, seven employees, in a bad year, five employees, plus my mom, plus my two brothers and me. And I learned from these great artisans that I worked with every day. But I had the experience, and it was a searing one, you know. Experiences you have as a child will cement themselves on your brain and you'll never forget them. I had the experience of working weekends and summers and nights and holidays when every, every time there was an order that had to be out, Dad would come up and wake me up and say, we got to do this. Well, Dad, I was going to do something else today. It's the last day of summer vacation, son. This is a family business, and what a family business means is the whole family's got to chip in. But I learned from these great artisans in my dad's shop. But I was going to high school and there was no career technical training. In my high school, it was the only thing that was important to anybody was going to college. And God knows college is so important. In Virginia, we're so lucky to have great institutions of higher education. And nationally, we have the crown jewels of the world in higher education. But, but it, was, it was odd to be with these fantastic artisans who were making a good living, who had been through a rigorous training program with the iron workers and be at a high school where the value of career and trades were never discussed. And in fact, there was even really sort of a stigma about them. That made a huge impression on me. When I was in the middle of law school, I took a year off to go to Honduras, as was mentioned. It was funny, I, I just wrote these missionaries that I knew through my high school and said, I want to come and volunteer. When I landed, they said, uh, 
So what do you know? I said, well, I'm in Harvard Law School. I said, well, that's precisely useless for, for, anything, for anything we're doing here. I said, well, my dad's a welder had an ironworking shop. I, now, now you're talking. <laughs> so even though my Spanish was pretty rusty at that time, they put me in charge of a school. They had just started to teach kids to be carpenters. I added a welding curriculum. I added a night school. I recruited more students. And in both my own house and then in that experience, I saw the power of career and technical education. We can't silo these things. That's the neat thing about Bobby's committee, education and workforce. You can't silo education over here and workforce over here, but sadly, we do that too much. You know, at the federal level right now, if you qualify for a Pell Grant, you income qualify for a Pell Grant, you can only use the Pell Grant in courses that are 14 weeks in length, which are the length of a college semester. If you want to do a, a two-week super intensive intro program to sheet metal or roofing, if you want to do a 10-week, nine to five, eight hours a day, five days a week, super intensive career and technical education, you cannot get a Pell Grant for that. And that, that suggests that we're thinking wrong about education. My oldest son's a Marine Infantry Commander. As a commander of a platoon or unit, he has the ability to approve up to $4,500 a year for any of his Marines in what's called a military tuition assistance payment. But it has to be utilized as part of a college curriculum. If somebody comes to him and says, I'm an ordinance officer, give me 300 bucks, I can pass the American Welding Society certification exam. I don't need 4,500, I need 300. He cannot authorize that because that's not part of a college curriculum. How idiotic. So we gotta break the silos down and community colleges are where this is happening. We're breaking the silos down between traditional college as it was thought in career and technical training and we're realizing everybody needs something after high school. Congressman Scott used the statistic that two thirds of jobs will require more than a high school education but I'm actually gonna say I think it's 100% of jobs because even somebody who is out of college, you can no longer expect that you'll go to work and be able to just coast off that skill set for your entire working life. No, no, no. You're going to need new skills along the way. So everybody is going to need more skills after high school, even college grads, even people with PhDs. When the community college movement started, and it started in Virginia, and I grew up in Kansas City, started in Kansas City about the same time, mid-1960s, we often called them junior colleges. Because there was a mindset, the idea was you would go to a junior college for a couple of years, and that would prepare you with an associate's degree to then transfer to a four-year college. And that was the majority of students who were going to the junior colleges. But over time, it soon became clear that that really wasn't the model. A whole lot of people come to TCC to get the associate's degree, but increasingly more and more and more people come to TCC or Paul De, uh, Paul DeCamp or, or uh, Dabney Lancaster in Western Virginia, Northern Virginia Community College or Thomas Nelson. They come not for the associate's degree. They come because they need a skill. They need a credential. They're thinking about a job change. They want to get a job promotion. They just want to be better at their job. But we still are often compensating community colleges, Chancellor Dubois knows this well, state budgets and federal. We compensate community colleges based upon the degrees that they're giving, but we don't often have a good me method to compensate them for the skills and the credentials that they are conferring upon talented students. So we have an opportunity as we write, re re rewrite the Higher Education Act this year to sort of broaden our thinking about education and break down these silos. And again, I will say community colleges really are right at the center of where it's at. Um, the community college system was sort of started conceptually by a governor named Albertus Harrison. My, and then the governor who followed him, Mills Godwin, took the idea and figured out how to fund it. Mills Godwin was a governor who beat my father-in-law. Mills Godwin was a Democratic governor from 1965 to 1969. My father-in-law, Linwood Holton, who's 95, ran against Mills Godwin as the Republican nominee and lost in that election. They were rivals. They didn't exactly love each other. <laughs> Lyndon ran in 1969 and won the governorship. He created a Republican party that could win a statewide election. He was the first Republican elected statewide. 
and he worked on education issues. Mills Godwin then switched parties, took the Republican Party over from my father-in-law, and ran for governor again, and won in 1973. So needless to say, my father-in-law was not a big chum of Mills Godwin's. <laughs> he lost the race to him, then after building the Republican Party, he lost the party to him. <laughs> if I say the word Mills Godwin around my father-in-law, here's what he says, built the community college system. Never talks about losing a race to him. Never talks about Mills, that Mills stole the party from him. He says, built the community college system. You have gone from zero to how many? 250 to 300,000, right? Between the mid-1960s to today, to between a quarter of a million and 300,000 students in the community college system. And that's because the community college system has done the best job of figuring out we're not in a world of silos anymore. We got to break down the silos. People need skills, people need credentials, people need associate's degree, bachelor's, master's, PhD. Everybody's got to have something after college, but different students have different talents, different students have different interests, and the community college system is probably the most flexible and creative part of the whole educational spectrum in terms of figuring out how to tailor programs to the particular needs of individuals in the workforce. Last thing I'll say is this, for the students who were we applauded earlier. As, as Bobby and I visited the employer reps who were working together with TCC to offer curriculum here, again and again they said exactly the same thing, we're having a hard time hiring people. The unemployment rate is low. The, the numbers came out last week, I guess it's at 3.7%. That's great, but it poses problems. It poses a lot of problems for employers that are trying to hire people. Some jobs can be outsourced. Construction jobs can never be outsourced. You've got to have people right here on the ground. The shipbuilding jobs because of national security, the ship repair jobs, are not going to be outsourced. We've got to do the overwhelming majority of it right here. There's work to be done. The only question is, will we have those trained to be able to do the work? And that's why today is such a good news day for the Commonwealth, good news day for Portsmouth, good news day for TCC, and I'm proud to be part of it. Thanks. I have been part of the community college movement since the mid-70s, and I, I am compelled, compelled to say, Senator, in my 40 years, I have never heard anyone give such an on-point description of the value of the community college system. Thank you so much. I would now like to invite um, all of the platform party and other elected officials to uh, gather around the ribbon and the congressman and the senator are going to pick up these very attractive saws. <laughs> you, I, you know, I was opposed to, but, but I think uh, so. So if, if I could get the platform party to come down, we'll cut the ribbon. And then uh, following that, we'll just continue our, our social time together. Thank you all for coming. We're going to cut the ribbon. Uh-oh. 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 Uh -oh. We cut it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there 